Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I, I am not Jack. My name is Alice Stevenson. I teach museum studies at UCL, one of Jack's colleagues. But I'm here to uh, introduce the speaker this afternoon. Um, author and zoologist Jack Aspey is currently the manager of the Grant Museum of Zoology at University College London. But only for a couple more days, because after 14 years, Jack is moving to the University of Cambridge to be manager of the Zoology Museum at Cambridge. When he's not doing all of those things, he's a trustee of the Natural Sciences Collection Association and the Society for the History of Natural History. And you'll see him in blogs, in the newspaper, regularly writing around and commenting on natural history museums um, in all their glory. And in fact, one of his most recent pieces of writing, a little plug here, and there are copies for sale, I believe, at the end, um, is Animal Kingdom, A Natural History in 100 Objects, a book that looks at the diversity of the animal kingdom that uh, explores mechanisms of evolution um, and my own personal favorite book, giving insight into the behind the scenes activities of a museum of natural history. And that book is the basis for the talk that you'll hear today. His main zoological interest is in the mammals of Australia and he spends a couple of months a year doing ecological fieldwork, but he's here in the UK and he will be here on stage just now. So less from me and more from Jack. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming everyone. Um, so I spend a lot of my time poking around natural history museums around the country and around the world. And uh, what I found there is, is basis for the book that Alice mentioned, but also a basis for a lot of thinking that I do about how natural history museums behave as windows onto the world of nature and that how, how natural history museums act as a means to talk about nature and to display nature and to convey nature to the, to the outside world. But what I'll be saying today is that the way that we do that isn't necessarily particularly representative of nature, it isn't particularly a natural way of talking about nature. Um, I'm not, I'm not going to, it's not, I wouldn't say any of these things are, well, not all of these things are a criticism, but more of a critique. Uh, I've spent my adult life working in natural history museums. I absolutely love them. I think they're wonderful. This isn't a, a chance for me to, um, to, to uh, put down natural history museums. But what I really hope is that what I say today will give people a chance to think about when they visit natural history museums, uh, which I recommend you do, uh, when they visit natural history museums, to, to start thinking about why are these things on display and not something else? Why, have the why has the museum uh, said this thing about uh, uh, the objects here? Or why has it chosen to not say other things? And why has it displayed them in the way they do? That's my hope here, because naturalist museums, are, or all museums, are not scientific, necessarily. They're not apolitical, and they are, they are uh, the consequence of the, the society and the, and the politics uh, and the cultures that they're embedded in. And, uh, and as such, they are, they are quite interesting places, but, but as I say, not necessarily scientific. Um, I feel of objects, and that's really what I'm going to be talking about. This is, this is where I work. This is the Grant Museum of Zoology at UCL, uh, just the other side of Regent's Park and left a bit. Um, so do, do come visit. They are, they, are, they are unusual places. The way we arrange them is not in the same way as you'd arrange, uh, as animals are arranged in the wild. So, for example, you can't really see much in this photo, but on the right there is a case of all the the carnivorans, so the cats, the bears, the dogs, the seals, the badgers. And where else in a naturalist museum would you see a lion and a walrus displayed together? These are, it's kind of, museums strip away a lot of the essence of being uh, of, the, of um, the animals themselves and replace the, that information with just a hard fact about, essentially in this case, how they're related to each other, which is interesting, but not the only, um, not the only story behind them. Um, so in, in this book and in, in my life, I like to think about what it is that objects can do, what, what can naturalist museum objects do, I've got one with me today, um, and what can they tell us? And as Alice said, I spend a couple of months a year on field work in Australia, and I think that the kind of the research in the wild uh, with live animals is, is one pillar of natural history which tells us something very, very different to natural history in the museum with dead animals. So I can learn, I've, I've worked with Tasmanian devils. Um, I've seen many more Tasmanian devils in the wild alive than I have 
in museum collections, um, which is a good thing, I imagine. Uh, uh, but what I've learned from natural history museum objects, what I've, what I've learned from those encounters with a skeleton or a skull in a natural history museum is very, very, very different from what I've learned from encountering a wild Tasmanian devil. There is only so much you can learn from, from seeing an animal alive in the wild. You can learn how it moves, how it behaves, how it interacts with the rest of its um, environment, which are all wonderful, but that doesn't necessarily tell you other things like how does it move? How does it fit, to, fit together in its environment in a, in a structural way? What, uh, how, how does it relate to other things? How has it evolved? How has it come to be? And that's a story we can get from natural history museum objects. So those are, those are two essential pillars of natural history. Um, and I'm going to talk to you, so the talk was the unnatural nature of natural history museums, I'm going to talk to you about the way that museums are biased in the way they talk about nature. We, 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 don't, um, we don't talk particularly straight about animals, um, but I'm also going to, tell you, tell, going to start with some more positive things. Um, natural history museum objects are interesting, I have one here. Uh, as I say, they, we ask them to work really, really hard. Um, my favorite animal is a platypus, that little platypus, the best animal in the world, it's a scientific fact. Um, and when you put, a, 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 we, you, you, there's very, very few naturalist museums, at least uh, in the UK, that don't have a duckbill platypus. And uh, let's say a taxidermy duckbill duck platypus. And we ask that object to do many, many things at once. We ask it to work really, really hard. The idea of a naturalist museum object, we use the word specimen. Specimen just means it's an example, a representative of a wider thing. So a duckbill platypus in a museum is there to represent all of duckbill platypus kind. It is there to be the sole a representative of its entire species. So that's quite a significant task we ask of it. We also ask it, we might also ask it to represent perhaps all of Australian mammals. If it was in a display about Australian mammals, that is a representative of global diversity in the Australian slice. So we're asking it to we might ask it to do that. We might ask it to represent a wider taxonomic group, a wider relationship group. So it might be there to represent all egg-laying mammals, for example. So that one single individual is there to work really hard to do something in that Tristan Museum. But at the end of the day, it's, it's not really a platypus. It's just an animal. It's just an object made of platypus. Someone has built that animal out of platypus skin, some wire, some, some wood wool sawdust or something like that, and a, uh, some fabric to create a specimen of a natural history, uh, of a real animal, of a platypus. And you can question how authentic that will be. Um, so at the same time as doing this really wide task, those objects also might do something really specific. They might also be representing their own individual story. And naturalist museum objects, all museum objects, tell a story of the time that they were collected, the person that collected them, uh, and the way that they were then treated in their, in their own individual history. So they've got this really wide role and the specific role. And when we start looking at these objects and the way that they've been uh, produced and turned into a museum object, it will tell us something about the, the time that they were collected uh, the, and the ecosystem that they, they looked at. We could chemically analyze them and say, what were they eating? Therefore, what was the environment like uh, at the time at a chemical level? Tell us about the human culture that collected them. So the politics of how did they get from, how, in Platypus case, from Australia to here, and what does that tell us about it? So I don't want to think about museum objects as just dead animals or even just as scientific uh, uh, evidence. They also reflect the, the local, the national, and the global politics of the times that they were collected. Um, and that's, that's where these biases come in that I'll be talking about. But to begin with, let's, let's start talking about the, the kind of things that we can learn from, a, from investigating museum objects. Um, I don't want to shout out what the object on the screen or the object here is? A oh, walrus, very, very good. Um, so this is a walrus skull, which is actually my, uh, my favorite skull in the world, despite not being, it uh, couldn't be further from being an Australian animal, actually, uh, being an Arctic animal. Um, and does anyone know what walruses eat? I think I heard someone say shellfish, which is correct. So, uh, but I think about 90% of a, of a walrus's diet are clams, bivalve mollusks that are about the size of a pound coin or so. Um, and the question is, how do they eat them? And that's what we can see from a skull like this. And it's quite extraordinary. If you ever look inside a walrus's stomach, you will not find, which I doubt any of you have, um, you will not find a single piece of shell. You're not going to find a single shell. You'll not find a single fragment of shell which gives the question, how does 
a walrus get the meat of the clam out of the clamshell uh, and into its stomach. Um, we might start by looking at its teeth and saying, uh, is it chewing the shells and then having some magical way, of, well not magical way, but very nifty way of, of getting, um, getting the meat, getting this, the, spitting the shells out and getting the meat in. If we look at these teeth, um, they're really, really, really smooth and really shiny. There's not a single scratch on them. And of course, if you're chewing a uh, mollusk shell, you would expect it to be scratched, so we can dismiss that. Well, I've got the jaw here. What they actually do is, is quite extraordinary. For obviously, firstly, walruses don't have hands. They have flippers, so how do they pick up the uh, tiny shellfish is the first question. And you can't really see this from the skull except for a bit of scarring around here. But what they do is that walruses have the most um, advanced and complicated facial muscles of any animal. They have uh, their whiskers, oh, they have long whiskers like, you know, a cat, um, but they also have really short, thick whiskers, which they can control incredibly finely, which when they are foraging around in the, in the mud at the bottom of the sea, they can feel for these shellfish and then actually pick them up in their whiskers like a hand. Uh, so they'll pick it up and then I'll put it in place. When they shut their mouths, there's a little ridge here, a little uh, divot in the lower jaw. Can you see this? Uh, that is where the shellfish sits. It's sitting right at the front of their mouth in, a, yeah, in this little crack. The next thing to notice about this is that I mentioned this group, the carnivorans, this is on the previous photo. The carnivorans is the order of mammals that includes seals and walruses and fur seals, but also cats, dogs, uh, stoats, weasels, and badgers, uh, um, bears, all those uh, civets and things like that. Um, these are all predators, they're all, all meat, or mostly all uh, meat eaters. If you look at the jaw of any other, pretty much any other carnivorant, uh, you'll find that this, this bone, which is separate to this bone, this bone, and this bone, uh, they're not very well connected in all these other animals, and that's because if you are a predator and you, you hunt and bite into live, living, large animals, if you bite into a deer, for example, if you're a tiger, um, and that animal struggles, you need your jaw to have a little bit of give to, to respond to the way the animal's struggling in its mouth. Um, so you expect to see a little bit of looseness. Ours are really, really solid because we, eat, uh, we can eat hard foods like nuts and things, uh, which we need our jaws not to give. So walruses are interesting because they're completely solid. There is, there is a very fused uh, seam down the middle here. So we've got our walrus in this situation where the shellfish, the clam is stuck at the front there. You can see that the palate, which is the inside of the mouth, is really arched. It's kind of like a tube, like this. And inside that tube will fit their tongue. And their tongue is, I like to describe it as a, as a meat sausage. It is almost a cylinder, like a salami of meat, uh, which they'll then stick to the front of uh, their jaws with the clam in place, clam clamped in place. And of course, as I say, their jaw has got no give. So there's, this is going to hold on very, very tight. And with that tongue, push to the front of the mouth, they suddenly whip it back and that creates a vacuum at the front of their mouths and shucks the meat out of the clam and they can just drop the empty shell. And you think of the pressure you'd need to pull a live clam, firstly apart and then out, and they can do that with the vacuum uh, piston-like uh, structure of their tongue. And we can see all of these things from a wonderful skull here. So walruses are absolutely amazing. While well, we've got walruses, the tusks. So we know what the tusks are for. Any ideas? For fighting, okay, so fighting is, is a good one. So when we see animals that have weapons, fighting is a, is a, is a good indication. And also, this is a female walrus. Male walruses can have tusks that are about a metre long or so. Females are a little bit shorter. Um, and, and normally, if we see a difference between the male and females, uh, there's something to do with, with what we call sexual selection. There's something to do with uh, how animals uh, win their mates, or win, win the, the ability to mate. And so in a case like that, we might think fighting is, is uh, in order because the males are bigger and the males ones that do the fighting. Uh, so yes, that is one thing that absolutely they do them for. But it doesn't explain why females have tusks. They do fight a bit too for territory, but not so much. Any other ideas? Up on the ice. Exactly, yes. So this is my favorite thing about walruses. The scientific name of a walrus is Odobinus, which if you know your Greek means um, tooth walker. And what they do is with their, this is the ice shelf or the floating ice, stick their heads out of the water, hook their tusks in, 
and then use them as, as kind of grappling hooks to haul themselves out of the water, which is pretty amazing. Um, they do other things like use them as, as ice anchors so they can go to sleep with their head above the water and their bodies in the sea by, again, hooking them into the ice like an ice anchor and just uh, floating and there without, without drowning. So it's quite cool. They can also use them as saws to cut into the ice. And people thought for a long time they'd use them as rakes to, uh, to find and to rake up the mud to get these clams out. But if that were the case, you'd expect to see um, scratches on the inside where they've dragged them through the mud. Uh, but there are no scratches on the inside, so we know they don't do that. In fact, there are scratches on the outside where they're dragged forwards through the mud as they're going forwards. The tusks aren't used in feeding. Um, so that's waters. That's one of my favorite skulls. Um, my second favorite skull. Any ideas what this is? It's some kind of snake. Yeah, this is a gaboon viper. In real life, it's about the size of my hand. Um, this is the snake with the longest uh, fangs of any snake. It's a venomous snake. Um, and this, all of the bones that you see on the snake skull have equivalents in our own, uh, in our own head. But our, head. our skulls are obviously made of plates of bone. The snake skulls have reduced those plates into very fine rods. So each of these, uh, yeah, each of these rods is equivalent, as I say, to one of these bones. Um, a bit of audience participation. I want you to try and do something. We should try it without moving your head side to side or without moving your neck. We should try and move as many parts of your skull as you can. <laughs> Not a lot of movement going on. Uh, I don't know how hard you're trying, but the only thing we can do is we can move it about five to seven millimeters left or right of center, like this. You can move it a couple of millimeters forwards and backwards. But that's about it. So we have very, very inflexible, very immobile skulls. Snakes have got uh, incredibly mobile skulls. So we can only move at our jaw joint. We can move up and down, obviously. We can move at our jaw joint, which incidentally is actually the equivalent of this joint at the front of the skull because all of these bones make up our inner ear, our middle ear bone, sorry. Um, which is pretty cool, but yeah, the teeth, the ones with the teeth at the front are the equivalent of ours. Um, but snakes can actually move their skulls, or can hinge their skulls. We, as I say, we have one hinge on either side. They've got eight hinges on either side. So they have a, a hinge. Uh, oh, no, it's wrong way. They have a hinge. That's the, the a kind of functional equivalent to our one. There's another one here. Uh, there's another one here. Another one here. Another one here, and there's another two on top. Um, and what that does is, oh, and also we talked about this, the mandibular symphysis, that's what this bone, this uh, joint in the middle of the skull is called. Uh, snakes don't really have one. Uh, it's not connected at all. There's a gap where there's um, some cartilage. So with all of this flexibility, it means that their brain case, so this, this section here contains the brain, a little rod uh, up on top. They can swing their mouths round so that their mouths become bigger than their heads. Uh, and it becomes a kind of full circle almost with just that brain case sitting on the top that allows them to eat. Obviously, they don't have hands and they don't have biting teeth, uh, so they can't cut anything up and they can't place it in. Uh, so that's how they, snakes eat uh, very large animals. Even more incredibly than that, they can move each side of their skull independently. Um, so these bones, keep pressing the wrong button. These bones, these teeth you can see are actually the bones of the palate, the pterygoids they're called, the ones inside the palate. Um, and these have got teeth on them, which is kind of scary in an alien kind of way. But what's really impressive about them is you can see that they're hooked backwards. They're, they're recurved, uh, pointing backwards. And they can move each side separately, and this is how they feed without hands. So they move one side forward, hook it in, pull it back, move the next side forward, hook it in, pull it back. And then when they lift it up to pull it back, they lift it up, turn it sideways so the teeth don't catch, and then put it back in again and push forward. So they can. What's interesting is that when snakes feed, the snake moves forward, but the animal, the prey, stays where it is. The snake's walking its head over what it eats. Absolutely incredible. So this is incredible, interesting things we can learn from a museum specimens before I get onto the point where I start critiquing. Which happens now. Um, so there are a number of ways that museums, this is what we can learn from the objects, but then we put them into displays, and they start doing different things. Um, there, there are certain biases, and I'm going to talk about four of them. So the first one is the kind of taxonomic bias, so with the different ways that, the different uh, proportions of animals that are on display. Does anyone have an idea of how many uh, animal species, living animal species, have been described to date, roughly? 
there is. There's, in fact, we're up to about a million and a half species, so 1.5 million. Does anyone have any idea how many uh, mammals have been described to date? About 5,000. So until January, the, the answer to that question would have been 5,500, and now we say 6,600, that there's someone did some new calculations on the ones that have been split or recently discovered. So of one and a half million of animals, only six and a half thousand are mammals. So if you were to draw a pie chart essentially the size of that screen, uh, you wouldn't really even be able to see the slice that contains mammals. There are so few mammals compared to global diversity. Uh, but when you go into a natural history museum, you are likely to see all of the galleries completely dominated by mammals. This is my favorite museum in the world. This is the uh, Museum of Comparative Anatomy, Zoology and Comparative Anatomy in Paris. Absolutely amazing. Everything in this photograph is a mammal. Uh, the entire, the entire uh, main gallery is taken up by mammals. Uh, most of the animal specimens in the Grant Museum on display in the central hall, well, in fact, all of the animals in the center of the museum where I work are mammals. So we have a massive bias towards uh, mammals because we're selfish. Mammals are uh, easy to display. We're interested in them. But it's a massive misrepresentation of nature. So of those one and a half million species, uh, about 900,000 are insects. I want to think, you to think about how many insects you think are on display uh, in many museums. And it is a very few, a very, very few. And if you see them, if they're there at all, they're likely to be the, you know, a few favorites, cherry picked, the bright blue, blue morpho uh, butterflies, maybe some spangly, nice looking flower beetles, which are very, very pretty. Uh, you're unlikely to see any flies on display, you're unlikely to see any fleas, you're unlikely to see many, many groups. And in fact, there are, more flea, there are more fly species in the UK than there are mammal species in the world. We do not put them in our museums. Um, I don't really mind because I like mammals, but uh, there are some people out there who get quite upset by this. However, uh, when we put animals in museums, or particularly large animals, um, there are kind of three classic ways of preparing them and displaying them. And skeletons is one, um, uh, taxidermy is another, and um, putting things in jars, preserving the whole animal is another. So they've got those, the three taxidermy or skins, uh, animals preserved in fluid, and skeletons. Um, out of curiosity, I want you to raise your hands. Which of those three you think is the most authentic? So which is the best representation of telling you about the animal? If you were to go into a museum and you wanted to see uh, a cat, um, would the best way of showing you what cats look like, your preferred, was your most authentic way, uh, I'm going to ask you whether it's skeletons, taxidermy, or uh, in a jar. So firstly, for skeletons, put your hands up. So for those watching at home, there's about eight people. Um, for taxidermy, put your hands up. That's quite a lot more, so 15. Uh, and uh, for animals in jars. Oh, this is surprising. That is by far the, the biggest group. I'm surprised at that because you very, very, very rarely see a fluid preserved mammal or a fluid preserved bird in a natural history museum. Our storerooms are full of them, uh, but we do not put objects like this on display. Actually, I put objects like this on display, but most museums wouldn't. Um, so this object is the most uh, controversial object in the Grant Museum. It's the object that we get the most complaints about. It's a fluid preserved cat. Uh, we get even more complaints about it when we display it the other way around. Um, <laughs> particularly if you notice, that, oh, if you notice towards the back there, uh, it's pregnant. Um, and people get really upset about fluid preserved cats, or in fact mammals in jars, because taxidermy is trying to convince you the animal is not dead, and, and you as visitors are willing to go along with that, um, generally, subconsciously. When you look at a skeleton, it's obviously dead, but it's also quite clean and clinical. Um, when you look at a, an animal in a jar, particularly a dissected animal, um, it's so obviously dead and it's so obviously gruesome that museums don't trust you not to freak out. So they will not put, very, very rarely will you see a mammal or a bird on display in a jar. Um, we normally put uh, fish, which live in water, uh, amphibians, which go in water, not that this is water, and reptiles, which nobody uh, has, <laughs> which people don't have the same emotional response to, is what I was going to say. Uh, <laughs> uh, my bias is always coming out. I, I work with reptiles uh, also. But yeah, so interestingly, we, 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 we have this bias towards mammals, but we, we are careful about the way we display them 
even though, yes, indeed, this is the most authentic way of displaying it because it's the whole animal, or more or less, uh, and it hasn't been artifacted by people, which I'll come back to. Um, our second bias is bias for massive animals, and this is related to, again, to the mammals as well. This is an amazing object. Don't let me get you wrong. Get, get, don't get me wrong. You walk it. Don't if you've been to the Natural History Museum since they um, redisplayed the, the main hall. If you walk in the front entrance, um, it's worth the queues rather than going in the side entrance to walk in and scare, stare down the mouth of this blue whale. It's incredibly, absolutely awe-inspiring. Um, but if you think about the Natural History Museum favourites, we've got the whales, we've got the dinosaurs. These are massive animals. When in reality, as I've mentioned. Nearly, well, 95% of animals, well, I said 900,000 species are insects. Uh, the rest of them uh, are um, tiny. So we have in the Grant Museum, tried to set this right. This is our microarium. If you haven't visited the Grant Museum, this is a highlight. It's our place for tiny things, only about 1.2 meters square. There's 2,500 uh, tiny animals. Each of these are uh, microscope slides showing a visible uh, but tiny animal, just to try and give some. Uh, limelight to the tiny animals that we do not put on our, in our natural history museums. Again, if you think about where are the worms, where are the fleas and the flies in our natural history museums, we don't, we don't put them on. And there's a reason for that. Not a good reason, but there is a reason for that. Um, so this is a penis worm. Uh, it's, it's called a penis worm because it looks like a human penis, or so, so, so thought the taxonomist that described it. Um, when did you last see a worm in a museum display. Not often, or only ever token. And in fact, uh, there, are, there are 38 ways of being an animal, 38 major phyla. So if you, uh, we are the, the vertebrates, or the, the you know, vertebrates are a part of one of those phyla. Um, but there are 37 others. About a third of them are worms uh, in some way. So we have penis worms, we have arrow worms, we have acorn worms, we have spoon worms, segmented worms, flat worms. I could go on. But we don't put worms on display because essentially when you put an object on display, when you make a museum exhibit, you have to fulfill uh, two key criteria, I think. Um, yeah. And the first of those is you have to give the people what they want. So you have to fulfill the visitors' expectations of what they, I have come to a naturalist museum because I like dinosaurs, or I like whales, or I like mammals. Um, and that's perfectly reasonable. Museums have to have visitors, and we have to get them in and show them what they want. And all of those things uh, are interesting, so that's fine. Um, so that's number one. Give the people what they want. Give them what they expect to see. The second thing they have to do is the displays have to communicate the stories that the museum wants to communicate, that it has decided that it is what is a museum. The museum is about natural history. So we all want to talk. There are certain animals with very, very exciting stories, and we want to put those on display. But the objects have to, the displays we do, have to do both of them. And the reason is this. If you were to put this object on display, uh, the, the penis worm itself is about three centimeters long. Um, penis worms are interesting. They, uh, there's only about 15 to 20 species in the entire phylum um, living. They've been around for about 520 million years, so a very, very old group. When, it's hard to talk about this without being a bit risque, but they, uh, they live in, in muddy sediments in shallow waters. And to move forward, they periodically engorge and deflate their heads. Um, and those heads have got spines inside of them. So as they move in and out, the spines are exposed and hidden, which, which basically pulls them forward as they catch on the mud in front of them. Um, so that's how penis worms are. They're interesting. So these are all perfectly valid things to say about them. But we don't put them on display because no one will look at this object. If you, it could be the most interesting thing in the world, but if no one's going to stop and look at a small brown beige, uh, boring looking animal, should we put it on display? It's a serious question, I don't have the answer to it. But should, it, do museums have a responsibility to be comprehensive uh, and cover the whole of, of animal kind? Uh, if we think we've only got limited display space, what is the point of putting an object on display, however interesting its story, if no one is going to look at it? Uh, I chose the penis worm um, to talk about this because, incidentally, there are a lot of worms on display in the Grant Museum because the Grant Museum doesn't do what most museums do. Um, but this is the only one that anyone looks at. So there, are, there are all those other worms I listed, but if you sit in the museum and listen, you'll see that people are talking about the penis worm. 
for obvious reasons. It's got massive letters that says penis worm written next to it. So you hear people so pointing at this, but that's the only one that anyone uh, talks about. So the question is, are some animals, do some animals look too boring to be in a museum? And it's a, it's a difficult question. I don't know if the solution is big neon arrows pointing towards these things to make, to catch people's attention. Um, the next bias is around where objects come from. So we have very, very biased geographical coverage in our museums. In the UK, uh, our bias is towards uh, the British Empire, obviously. So we uh, have many, many more Australian animals, for example, than we do Chinese animals. Again, good for me. Um, but this is my third favorite animal. Does anyone know what it is? An echidna, absolutely right. So the echidnas are the only living relatives of the platypus. Um, and we will find, it's again, like the platypus, it's rare to go to a natural history museum and not find an echidna. If you were to go to a uh, museum in France, you will find a geographic bias towards South America and North Africa, uh, and likewise for any uh, country with an imperial past. Um, those biases are very, very pre uh, obvious. And, um, and you might think, actually, that's entirely fine, and, and uh, you know, it's, that's just the nature of the beast. There is a, the, the logistical reality of going to Australia and shipping back an animal uh, when you have uh, the kind of diplomatic relationship we had have with Australia. Uh, had, actually. Um, very hard to get animals out of Australia now. Um, then, yeah, just logistically that makes sense. But there is, a, if you think about it, there's a more uh, insidious uh, story behind this, and that's that the act of collecting in a country is, is, I would argue, part of the act of colonialism, of colonization. Um, and that when people were exploring and, and settling and invading these countries, it wasn't just good old-fashioned, excellent science, this is interesting, aren't echidnas excellent? Yes, they are. Let's get them in our museums. Um, it's also the, the, well, what has this country got in terms of animal, vegetable, mineral resources? that we can exploit and make the most of back home. Echidnas may not be the best example of this because there aren't really huge economic values to uh, echidnas, but there are certainly are in botany a huge uh, economic value and in, in minerals and certainly in some animals. Actually, platypuses have recently uh, had some medical implications, which is good. Actually, while we're on, we're on the echidna, uh, I was talking about which of these object types is the most authentic. Um, and I don't know, <laughs> there are, there's an excellent Twitter uh, account, Crap Taxidermy, uh, that, that I recommend you look at for enjoyable taxidermy. I, I hope you will agree this is a, a decent looking, high quality piece of taxidermy that we think is an accurate representation of uh, an echidna. In fact, it isn't. Uh, echidnas, as I say, or sorry, taxidermy, as I say, uh, is a man-made object, and so is a skeleton, is a man-made object. The decisions of how this object came to be uh, are human, and what would have happened, particularly uh, in historic taxidermy, is that someone would have gone to Australia, clubbed or shot uh, an echidna, skinned it in the field, in most likelihood, and then sent it back to the UK or to Europe, somewhere else, to be um, taxidermized. And at best, they would have drawn a picture of what an echidna looks like. Uh, at wor uh, well, they may have written some notes of what an echidna looked like, but um, quite possibly you just got the skin, and then the taxidermist back here, uh, and this taxidermist clearly has skill. It's not overstuffed. It's not uh, got gaps. You often see gaps around joints or elongated neck. So he's, this is a skill. I assume it's a he, because um, it generally was. Uh, but however, uh, this echidna's feet are pointing in the wrong direction. Um, echidna's back feet should point backwards. Echidnas are, are, are excellent animals because if you, uh, if you frighten an echidna, which is very easy to do, just by walking up to it. Um, they do this with all four feet and sink vertically into the ground, leaving just this mat, this mat of, of spines um, to, and their heads are tucked under so you can't, you can't get them. But to do that, they need their feet to point backwards so their claws can make this big arc. And the taxidermist has had to use uh, his own assumptions and biases. And it's, it is a reasonable assumption to make that animals' feet point in the same directions as their heads in the case of the echidna, it was wrong. Um, but when we see a lot of taxidermy, you, and, and though, to do so, you can't quite make it out at this light level, um, but it's very easy to see on the object. Um, the echidna's ankles have actually been ripped, where he's 
turn the skin 180 degrees and it's an impossible uh, anatomical arrangement. Um, so that, that's, that's not great. Um, but we often see a political bias or a human bias in taxidermy. The fox or the tiger with that snarling face. Now foxes cannot make that face, um, but you'll see it in taxidermy everywhere. And the reason or an, an, an argument for why that is, is, um, is that the, the, the hunter and the collector and the museum are wanting to, to be shown, seen to over, have overcome uh, this ferocious beast. And we're putting this fearsome, nasty creature uh, in its place in a museum. And I, the hunter, the collector, have, uh, uh, um, I'm bigger and scarier and uh, more manly than that animal was because I've shot it. And that, uh, those teeth are evidence of that. So we can see these politics. I'm going to keep talking about politics of, well, who can tell me what this animal is? And I, I, so I, I is a very, very famous uh, Madagascan lemurs. Um, they're famous for uh, some pretty extraordinary attributes. They're effectively mammalian woodpeckers. So they've got these really big ears, which they can listen for, for beetle larvae, for grubs, um, just uh, under the, under the wood in, in trees. And then they've got very, very sharp gouging, gouging incisors. They can cut a hole in the, in, the, in the bark. And then they've got, if you can make it out, but, yeah, if you can make it out, they've got really, really long middle fingers, hard to demonstrate politely. Um, really long, thin middle fingers uh, that they use to hook out the uh, beetle larvae. Uh, very, very interesting animals. Does anyone know what this animal is? It's not a yapok, but you're taxonomically close. This is, this is a striped possum. Put your hand up if you've heard of a striped possum. We've got two, three hands up in the room, all from zoologists. Um, so striped possums uh, live in, in northeastern Australia, nor, very north tip of Queensland, and three, spe uh, three or four species in New Guinea as well. Um, and they do exactly the same thing. So they have very good hearing. Uh, they have exactly the same arrangement of these sharp gousing incisors. Uh, if I had put a skull picture in here, you'd see that. And they have this elongated middle finger as well to hook it out. Exactly the same thing. Um, so my question is, why has everybody heard, or nearly everybody heard of an eye eye, but nobody has heard of this striped possum? And my argument is that, uh, we're, firstly, we're biased towards primates, because we are primates. Uh, but secondly, we are biased against Australian animals. Uh, that how many times have you heard or read that platypuses, echidnas, and also marsupials are primitive? I mean, this is a popular idea in, in uh, kind of the zoological popular zeitgeist. Um, firstly, it's impossible for a living animal to be primitive. All animals are evolved as, as evolved as any other thing. Uh, firstly, you know, these, are, these are mammals. So if you were to go along with the idea of some animals being primitive or not, they can't be that primitive. Um, that's not really a, a good argument. You know, it doesn't, that argument doesn't stand up to scrutiny. But, I, but the way that we talk about Australian animals is, is often pejorative. You know, they are, they are, everything will kill you, is what you've heard. That's a, a way of, um, and, and actually striped possums are believed to be this striking black and white because they have um, noxious chemical uh, defenses, um, which is interesting. But that, that's, yeah. So the idea of things being, uh, of things being, uh, Dangerous is pejorative. Uh, and if you even, like the way we talk about them taxonomically, so the, the name, the, the taxonomic name for marsupials is metatheria, which means uh, half beasts. Uh, whereas our own group, the, the placental mammals, are the eutheria or true beasts. And I think this all contributes to kind of late 18th century zoology uh, when Captain Cook in 1770 landed not far from where these guys live, actually almost exactly where these guys live, um, and started to talk about Australian animals in a very pejorative way. As a, you know, the first settlers went on to talk about it. The first European settlers in um, the first fleet started to say that Australian animals, marsupials, were against the laws of nature. Um, and it all contributes, I argue, to the idea that Australia is inferior, the concept of terra nullius, that nobody lived there, which is, of course, not true, uh, and that it was claimable that, that Cook one of his missions was to take possession for the crown of any unoccupied lands. I think the way we talk about our animals uh, contributes to that idea, which obviously he took possession of an occupied land um, in Australia. Um, so the empire and politics. The next one, um, f uh, final one, is about 
uh, the, the sex bias in museums. Um, that when you go to a natural history museum, particularly, or particularly for birds and mammals, you will find that there is a far, far greater number of males on display than females. And in fact, except for, so as I can tell, this specimen here, and maybe the baby, um, all of the objects in this display are males. And it's not too hard to think why that might be. And that's that when uh, animals, and the males and females of a species are different, particularly in mammals and birds, it's typical that the male is the more impressive one. So the male is the one with the massive horns or the big antlers or the big tusks or uh, the fancy plumage. A female, by comparison in birds particularly, is more likely to be drab and brown uh, or antlerless or hornless, or at least in the case of many antelope, smaller horns. Um, and that means that if you're a collector, you are more likely to want to go and shoot the more impressive thing, firstly because you're easier to sell it um, to a museum, but then when it comes to the museum, museums are more likely to display it. So we can, we can and in fact, a colleague of mine at, uh, is currently at Leeds City Museum, Rebecca Matchin, did a study of a typical natural history gallery and found that, um, let me check my numbers, 29% of the mammals of, on display were female, and 23% of the birds on display were females. So there's a huge numerical bias uh, in our natural history displays. And again, as I say, you, you might excuse that as a, as a historical bias of the collecting. That's also the reality of the collections behind the stores. There's a male bias because of those collectors. But actually, the way we then display and talk about these um, animals in the displays are biased as well. So she found that when males and females are in a case alongside each other, the males were more than likely to be higher in the case, looking down on the females, uh, which is an interesting, presumably subconscious uh, curatorial decision. Again, we can say all well, these displays are old. That's, that's not how we think now. But even in modern interpretation, even what was written in modern displays, there was a, a difference in how museums spoke about males and female animals. And the, the male animals, would have very generic natural history objects, labels. So this animal lives here, it eats this, it has this interesting adaptation where it can walk on its teeth. Um, by contrast, the females would be interpreted in, uh, only in relation or, or nearly exclusively in relation to their ability to produce young. Now, so the, the females are depicted as mothers, the males are depicted as, as otherwise broadly interesting. When of course, the males also have children uh, in most cases, and the uh, females also eat and move and have evolved from other things. And so we, but those, those generic facts weren't applied to the females. And you might question when a visitor goes into a museum and is given this kind of information about uh, sex roles in the, na in the natural world, what impression that, that leaves us with. So yes, we see many, many more uh, males on display. But interestingly, we don't see all of the males. Can anyone spot anything unusual about this skeleton? Other than the tail in front. Um, penis bone, thank you. So this is one of the very few examples I've ever seen of a skeleton with its penis bone attached. Now most mammals have penis bones. Uh, the two biggest groups of mammals, the rodents and the bats have penis bones. So do the, uh, most of the primates, we don't. Uh, and the shrews, moles, hedgehogs, and uh, the carnivores. So this is a, a caca missile, which is an American raccoon, South American raccoon. Um, it doesn't actually, the penis bone doesn't actually articulate with any of the other skeletons. So it's actually, it is easy to lose a penis bone when you're uh, skinning an animal, because you generally start by circling the genitalia and skinning up the belly. So because it's not attached to the rest of the skeleton, it's easy to lose it. Nonetheless, there, are very, there is a common curatorial practice, uh, at least historically, but I would say still today, to remove the penis bones. So you go to an actress museum stores and you'll find drawers and drawers and drawers of penis bones. I have one here. This is uh, the penis bone of a walrus. Um, this is the largest penis bone. They're also called bacula, um, bacula yeah, baculum singular of a penis bone. This is the body end, this is the other end. Um, and it's, no one really knows why they have them. Uh, it's presumed to be about uh, increasing stamina and just increasing the likelihood of 
a successful insemination. But Victorians, uh, sorry, uh, curators again, don't trust you not to freak out. Uh, so they remove the penis bones and also the few animals that have clitoris bones are typically removed as well, uh, which is like museums are supposed to be scientific, you would think. So deliberately removing part of their anatomy uh, just to, in case the visitors freak out is a, an interesting scientific thing to say, to talk about. Um, I have one more. I'm not going to talk about that. So <laughs> all of these stories, as I mentioned, uh, are in this book. But this is... Uh, <laughs> these, as I say, are... Um, the point of the book is to talk about not only these interesting evolutionary natural history stories that we can get from, from museum objects, but also the way that we think about objects and the way that the objects, the roles that objects play in uh, natural history museums and, and the human stories and the human biases behind uh, what we say about them. Uh, and I will finish there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jack, for an engaging and thought-provoking lecture. And I'm sure there are many questions, and we've got about 10 minutes or so. So please, if there are any questions from the audience, I'm sure Jack would be delighted to ask them. Um, I recall you said your favourite museum was in Paris. Um, what's your least favourite natural history museum? Oh! I don't know if I have an answer to that. I've never... I don't remember going to an natural history museum and thinking, wow, this is terrible. Um, um, have you been to the Creation Museum? No. Okay. no <laughs> probably, probably that. <laughs> yeah. uh, hello. Um, I've, I've been to the museum in uh, Cambridge, and they have an iguanodon where they broke the spine to make it stand up and be scary like a dinosaur, and it really was uh, walked around on four... Is that the museum you're going to go to? Uh, no, that's the Sedgwick Museum, so that's the Earth Science yeah. Museum opposite. Um, but that's so a good example of what you Absolutely. Said. So dinosaurs, I think one of them was one of the first dinosaurs to be described, and well, a number of mistakes were made with it. Uh, firstly, um, it's got a, they found a big conical spike. Um, is conical the right word? Yes. A conical spike uh, but in, in, in some of the first uh, fossils that they found of it. And the earliest depictions, including the Iguanodon model sculpture in Crystal Palace, you know, the Crystal Palace dinosaurs. Uh, if you look at its nose, firstly, the animal's arranged like an iguana uh, because it's called Iguanodon, which means iguana tooth. The teeth of the Iguanodon look like the teeth of an iguana. It's not very clever. Um, so they're based scaling up. All oh, their teeth are similar, so therefore their entire bodies are similar. Um, they've just made a giant iguana. But this conical spike is put on the animal's nose a bit like a... A rhino, or in fact, it was its thumb. Um, so the first one, and then uh, you're absolutely right, the earliest depictions of, uh, of, iguanas, of iguanodons were in a kangaroo-like pose, so very much upright, uh, whereas we now know that they could move between two legs and four legs, and they were kind of at that angle. But the, the concept of dinosauriness is a really interesting one. So in your head, you know, probably not in your heads, but in many people's heads, think of a T-Rex, it is in a similar kangaroo-like pose, uh, up, very, very upright, or dinosaurs are, are tail-dragging, slow, sluggish animals. Um, Whereas well, actually, the T-Rex, again, is almost horizontal in its pose, uh, we now know. Um, but it's, these are, you yeah. you could pose a, you could pose any animal skeleton in pretty much any way you like. And that, again, you think of a, of a skeleton as a relatively inert scientific object. You don't think, oh, but it's been wired together. You know, when people discovered uh, mammoth, uh, ele extinct elephant, um, species in Mediterranean, for example, you could easily pose that as a, a bipedal two-legged animal, even though it's an elephant, and think it was a giant, you know, because you, you can just move the bones around. It's, you know, there's a lot of human interpretation of these things. Oh, sorry, so I didn't see you. If, uh, <clears throat> if this were the year 1918, would uh, your lecture have been different? If it was 1918, 1-8. 100 years ago. Uh, good question. Um, I don't know, because particularly in dis museum displays, a lot of the objects are the same. You know, the, the Grant Museum, which I showed at the beginning, we, it was, that museum was only arranged in 2011, but it was the same objects as in the collection in 19. 
So probably not. And actually, what I think about, is interesting about these taxidermy uh, issues is that so much, and what I didn't say, which I meant to say, that is if you go to any museum and see an echidna, I, which I, I look, the, look out for this, and please, when you see an echidna in a museum, tweet me a picture of it, that there are, that there are more than half of the echidnas are opposed wrong. And so we choose, as museum people, to still put these objects on display. Most people in the world have never seen an echidna, uh, and their only interaction with an echidna is in a museum. But we choose to say it's fine that this is an incorrect animal. We are teaching people the wrong thing deliberately, um, not de well, consciously, I would say, but without choosing to do anything about it. So I suspect the museums would look the same, or the objects that we put on display would look the same, because they've still been there. But, uh, the, idea, the idea behind the museum, the has it changed? David Attenborough has ever passed through this thing, television, modeling, uh, animation, nothing of this has happened yet. Yeah, absolutely. And, but the museums, fun, the, well, museums have many roles, but the public side of the museum, I would say, hasn't changed that much. It's got a lot more uh, conversational uh, rather than very didactic, this is a fact, um, but perhaps less so in science, natural history museums than in other, in other places. But we still ask people to come and look at and read about and, to, and see the same objects. So, yeah, we don't have, we did, they obviously didn't have data after a, a hundred years ago, but I don't know if that means the museum would have changed. Interesting question. How much collecting and taxidermy and things like that still goes on in natural history museums? Because they're pretty full. They are pretty <laughs> full, absolutely. So uh, a few mus research museums still collect. So you'll, museums typically don't collect for display. Well, very, very rarely will museums collect for display. But there are a handful of museums in this country that have significant research profiles. So all of the national museums. So in South Kensington, uh, Edinburgh, Cardiff, Dublin, Belfast, um, all collect, and also Oxford and Cambridge have a research staff. So they will still be amassing objects for research. However, when they go out and do that, unlike pre-1992 when the legislation came in, they will always do it with a partner organisation in the host country that they're with. And typically, it will be a, maybe a, you know, a team comp comprised of uh, of the, of the host nation scientist and uh, UK scientists, and then they'll either split the collection or all of the collection will actually end up staying as belonging to the host nation and they'll just lend things in. But yeah, collection for display yeah, really doesn't happen, except when they die in zoos, when um, we tend to we can get them that way. Um, so you talked a lot about issues with display and representation of animals, which makes sense because they're often the focus and you work at a zoological museum. But do you have anything about the display of non-animal life and geological specimens and things like that? Yeah, sure. So if you think insects get a, plot, a hard time, plants uh, get an even worse time. We spend a lot of time in, in my charities with, with botanists and they're... they're their fun and games to go around the Natural History Museum is to find the plant. Um, and that is a depressing uh, exercise because it's nearly always uh, willow or um, a rose or yeah, hemp or something pretty boring. And yeah, so there are significant biases there. Bacteria and viruses, nowhere. Um, though interestingly, the next exhibition at Oxford University Museum of Natural History will be on bacteria. But if you think displaying a worm is difficult, <laughs> I have no idea how they do that. Um, absolutely, yeah. The, we are, that just museums are biased towards animals, certainly. But then, how do you display minerals in an interesting way? Um, people who like minerals really like minerals. Other people, you know, you go to the British Mineral Gallery at the Natural History Museum and there are not a lot of people in there um, because it is an encyclopedic row of, of wooden cases, glass tops with rocks in them. Um, and that is what the physical reality of a mineral is. It's not very displayable. Um, so I don't know the answer to that. Fortunately, I don't work in museums with minerals. So. <laughs> yes. One last question at the back. Um, how closely do the museum collections fit with like the socio-political borders at the time of collection? So, for instance, if you knew nothing of Earth 
came to a museum, would you be able to go, oh, obviously England colonized the Caribbean at yeah. this time, or the same with, say, India or the foundation of the Americas? Yes, I think you would be able to do that. I guess that's exactly what would happen, that you can see where the, where the diplomatic relations lie. And that it's strange to think like, how big you know, Russia and China are, or how many animals live in them, but how, many, how few uh, Russian or Chinese species we have on display in our museums. Um, we might get some pandas, uh, but not a lot of other things. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you, yeah, I think those aliens would have a very skewed view of what nature is like and what biodiversity is like on Earth, as I've mentioned. But yeah, I think you could trace those, those relationships. Um, join me in thanking Jack once again for one